Hello everyone, Danny Rady here from Asperger Experts. With me, I have a very, very special guest. Uh, all the way from Australia, we have the wonderful Holly Bridges. And she, Hi. Yes, hello to you too. Uh, she is the author of one of my favorite books on autism, that's Reframe Your Thinking Around Autism by Holly Bridges. Um, if you've ever heard me talk about defense mode, you've probably heard me mention the vagus nerve or vagal tone or even the polyvagal theory by Stephen Porges. This book is about how all that stuff, the vagus nerve, the polyvagal theory informs us about autism. It's the best book that I found to explain it in layman's terms, because honestly, when I read the polyvagal theory, I had to Google every other word because it is pretty much a 400 page scientific dissertation that's not immediately accessible to most people. So um, Holly, you're one of the people I can count on like one hand who really truly gets what Asperger's is about that doesn't exactly have it. So I thank you, that is amazing. By the way, you can get her book on Amazon, Reframe Your Thinking Around Autism. Um, it is a wonderful book that it's really one of the few, if not the only book I suggest on Asperger's and autism that actually makes sense and works. Because most of them are either like a memoir of here's my life, which is great, but not entirely actionable. Or here's all the science and like, let me just drill down on Asperger's this affects affect regulation and social inhibitory functions. Blah. You're just like, okay, tell me what to do. How does this impact my life? So this book is great for that. Um, so hello and welcome. Thank you. Hello. You I'm are, very glad you liked my book. Yes, I, you are very welcome. I, I love your book. Um, so for the people that don't really understand Asperger's and autism and really just think that it's just sort of a, a social deficit, as the DSM says, how would you define it with this new understanding that you have? Oh, it's interesting. When we talked last time, there were so many ways to look at autism. So this is one in that yeah. sense. So, you know, I interchange autism Asperger's. Yeah. The way I like to look at it is we're a set of systems and I, you go back to a body system with the polyvagal theory. We've got ways that our social operating systems work mm -hmm. and um, that then affects our social capacity. But we can only have a social capacity because our eyes and our ears and our face and our heart and our connection all work together and so it's much more body. And the polyvagal theory suggests that, that we go into a shutdown mode quite rapidly as a defense mode, which is your, your language. Um, but it's a very natural human response that people with autism Asperger's have um, almost a tripwire for it. So it's yeah. happened really early on. It's a learnt response. It becomes them and it becomes very normal for them to um, respond to the whole world in that way rather than specific events. Yeah. And then unfortunately, as you said, there just isn't a social capacity. It's like saying, why won't this Apple II computer from the 80s connect to the internet? It's like, because it can't. It, yeah. There is no capacity for that. You can, tra you know, uh, all the, that's why I say don't teach social skills first, because anytime you try and teach somebody with Asperger's social skills without getting them out of defense mode, you're just throwing money down a pit. It, it does nothing good because there is no capacity yet. And I think that's the part that most people miss is it's not just an ability issue. You would first address the capacity issue and then you address the ability issue. And, and like 90% of all the therapies and stuff I see skip to sort of just, oh, let's address the ability issue. Because that's what's important. And it's exactly. like, yeah, it is important. It's not just throwing money down a pit either. It's causing people to fail. Yeah. Which I don't like. And often it hurts because if you're in that kind of really um, harsh physical state, being taught to do eye contact, being taught to tie your shoelaces is very unpleasant. Whereas you get someone reduced, you get them down. Yeah. A lot of other stuff is effortless. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, is that it's, it's like, then you sort of get this, am I broken? Because everybody else seems to do this and I'm not able to do this. And is there just something more? flawed with me or what's going on because everybody says oh you're fine you just need to learn social skills and then you try and learn social skills and it just doesn't work the way that everybody says it will no and people with autism have so many other body issues as well yeah. they, have, they have a lot of illness attached or they don't you know some people can't go right. to the toilet and they're yeah. nine and they're ten yeah 
Yeah, there's right. a, I mean, it's comorbid with so many stuff. Uh, the most common one I've seen is gut issues, any form of just digestion fun. And by that, yeah. I mean lack of. But um, yeah, there's so much stuff going on that I think people miss that that capacity issue and just go straight to assuming that they can. And if they don't, then it's either will for ignorance, defiance or something else. And it's not an issue of just straight up like the thought doesn't even cross their mind that maybe they literally don't have the capacity to deal with that. I think we're not used to thinking about human capacity in terms of physiology. Yeah. We're just not. We just, we love the brain. I mean, that's why I start the book that way because it's all just put your brain into gear or do mindfulness and just get on with it. And, and we, we don't take two steps back and look at how, the only way we can talk is that that physiology is wired up properly. Yeah. And that was so beautiful about Porges' work is he, I mean, it, it, it's extremely complex if you yeah. have to do it properly. Yeah. <laughs> when you don't, you it, ah, it's too much. <laughs> I looked online and everyone just writes, oh my God, snore. Except he has to write it with that much um, depth because yeah. it's a science, you know, and it, it yeah. does work. It, beautiful but but the simplicity of it is um it made everything make sense in terms of being able to look at ourselves as a body yeah i mean for me people like i had somebody post on our group uh, last week that they were worried that their 14 year old son was playing video games and how is he going to be able to hold a job in 10 years and i'm like well first of all he's 14 his brain isn't fully mm -hmm. developed yet. Neither is his body. He literally has another entire decade to go. And in that time, one of the things that will develop is long-term planning and, and a whole bunch of other stuff, which means that he will be able to do that. So, like, uh, people just have this idea that when you're born, that's it. And, yeah, you physically get bigger. And, and like, you know, maybe up until the age of five, you act like a child and then you don't or something. But there's not this idea of of physical capacities. Like one of the things I find most interesting is that the vagus nerve, the, the capacity for your vagus nerve to dampen fight or flight is a real physiologically measured thing that there's a nerve in your body that controls how freaked out you are on a regular basis. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and it learns how to do that. So it's got its norm. Yeah. So you get that norm really really tense and hyper and that's what's comfortable to you and then like every nobody really addresses that they're just like oh let me just like m medicate you and then throw you into aba training rather than like can't we like ah oh, and like get used to a new norm for me that's what i had to do was was like train myself through methods i'm sure we'll talk about them soon uh, of how to get used to a new normal and how to like relax myself to allow my vagus nerve to work fully. One of the interesting things I find about that is that like one of the ways the vagus nerve works is when you're exhaling, but when you're in this state and really, really tensed up, you hardly ever fully exhale and take a deep breath. So it's sort of the self repeating pattern. And it's supposed to be. Yeah. Because that's what you need to do in that physiological state. Yeah. So if it's innate, it's supposed to be like that. So you have to cut it off at the knees in a different way. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's why I actually find breath work quite difficult for people with autism and people who are in a heightened state. Yeah. Because because it's quite hard for them when they're really locked to do yeah. that mindfulness kind of breathing yeah. thing. It's, yeah. it's, there's so many different ways to approach it. You could approach it from the gut. You could approach it from the breath. You could approach it from uh, vagal tone stimulators through like sound and stuff. There's there's a whole bunch of different ways to approach it. And and I agree with you. Some of them are, are better than others. Um, yes. Well, there's enough people with autism that you can pick your therapy. Yeah. <laughs> it's really isn't it? Throw stuff in the wall and see what sticks, but... Make sure you're throwing it at the right wall first. Yes, exactly, exactly. There's there's a lot of different body stuff, and the polyvagal theory brings it all back down together to me. So yes, you can use the gut. It's bidirectional, so it goes from your brain down to your gut and back up again, and it's constantly talking. So yeah. you can come in it from a gut issue. You can come in it from a um, a more intellectual level, yeah. and you do both together in various ways. Yeah. You know, same with your work. You 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 have a cognition about the work that you're doing and then you do your body stuff as well. 
it, it's so much more effective. Yeah. Um, the best thing I've ever found to do in terms of body stuff, like I sort of separated into, into three distinct chunks. You have the intellectual stuff, you sort of have the somatic stuff, and then you have the gut stuff. And those to me are, are separate because with like the somatic stuff, you can just do being with it and stop, drop and check like Ava does and, and somatic experiencing and all the stuff I like am uh, evangelist about. And, you know, you can get rid of all your sugars and eat a lot healthier and you have a lot more probiotics and fermented foods and things like that in the gut realm. And then you can sort of learn how to build trust and learn how to uh, not think every thought and things like that in the cognitive realm. Yes. Yeah. You, you heighten your awareness all of the time. Yeah. Like any good human being learns how to do if they're yeah. clever. And you start watching what your brain's doing. Yeah. And you... You're more than your brain. You're more than your body. It's yeah. what we're supposed to learn. So what have you found to be the most effective um, methodologies when you're working with your clients? Like we're saying, I think a cognition of it matters. <clears throat> I try and explain the theory as well as I can, depending. Like I've, this afternoon I'm going to see a guy who's 27 and nonverbal. Yeah. So that's a different I've got quite a range of people I might have a nine-year-old with anger issues I've got him and then a 26 year old girl with Asperger's and epilepsy mm -hmm. so the cognition about what I'm doing is different for each person but I at least try to get them to see what's happening enough um, and then I've got a few different exercises that I use that that drop the body I don't I, I go there first. I, I sort of teach that first and then work towards how you would add in what's happening for you, add in the world, yeah. that sort of thing. I just and really like all people. that stuff. Well, it, it, it's vital, but you have to, it's so, as you know, uh, um, confounding to have a different body state. When you think this is you and then you, you bring someone down to a different state, it's, it's quite enough of cognition for that for some time and once people have had a week or two of kind of feeling like that then you can start their self-perception shifts just because it does anyway yeah um, um and then it depends on the person like this guy i'm working with this afternoon we're up to week 15 and i'm he, it's taken him i've got permission to talk about it, it it's taken him 15 weeks to learn how to do this exercise i've got on a football which which is lying down, putting your feet on a ball and just doing this. And it's taken him that long just to coordinate his, his legs, like to, for his brain to tell each foot what to do. It's taken yeah. forever. But in the meantime, he's doing all of these extraneous activities that he wasn't doing before. So he was doing nothing at home and just um, really um, had stilled all his activities for two years. He really hadn't done anything. And each week, incrementally as we worked, he was then out in the shed cutting wood and riding his bike and turning the TV on and, and just slowly sort of warming up and waking yeah. up again. Yeah. So I, I do that. And then I've got someone who's in a much more body operational state so they can talk, they can interact a whole lot more and, and, I think his cognition is as good as anybody else's. His perception is, but his capacity to, to share himself with the world is very, very limited. Yes. Um, but then I've got, you know, I've got someone with, with Asperger's and aut um, epilepsy, and it's been a really big deal just to teach her to feel safe in her body. That's because the Because it's more than just Asperger's. Yeah. It really wigs out all the time. But again she's just blossoming in a very, very short space of time. But it's just by doing that. And with her, I do my hand reflexology more than anything. We had, we had to very slowly do this to just so she could feel safe feeling impulses. So it's not an emotional impulse. It's just the, just the environmental stimulus. And we've gradually got her to a point where, where she, she'll let me work on her hand instead of her mum. And... Now she's doing the football stuff. So, you know, I, I just slowly add it in depending on where, yeah. where the person's at. But it fascinates me that each week they come in and, you know, like she's had her hair straightened and she's caring what she looks like. 
and she's interacting with people at home in a way that she wasn't before. And so you just see this blossoming all the time. And I leave people's houses. I do home visits and, and at my office. But I, I pinch myself sometimes because it, it stuns me how fast the change is for people when, when they just feel right in their body. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, it, when I first discovered this and, and worked with myself and then clients and everything, it was profound how fast it was like, you know, 20 years of nothing. And then all of a sudden in the span of like literally two working hours of therapy, it's just like, boom. <laughs> yeah. So for people that the, the big problem I had when I started to learn about this was, was when people just said, what do you like your body? I'm like, what do you mean? Of course I have a body. It's right here. Like, look, here's my arm. Here's my body. I'm feeling my body. Like, what, what do you mean? Feel your body. So the, what's the very base level definition of like, of feeling your body and doing body work? What does that actually mean for people in a, in a down to earth level? Just noting your states. I don't think people even notice that they're in a heightened state yeah. and they can't notice it till you give them a different one. And then they've got a measure and it, that alone is profound Yeah. because, because you think it's you. And the minute that shifts, even a, Jilly second of a millimetre, <laughs> that's not a slightly right term, um, they, there's a gap and there's a space. And the minute there's that space, their awareness can flip in there and have a look around. And, the, and then their brain has some capacity that it didn't have before. And that is all you have to do is build on that. So I don't know how you explain it for people. Um, you did, it did a good job. It's, it's really just that for me, what happens is that you think like you're up here and you think this is normal and this is just how everybody lives and, and you don't even know you're tight. And then all of a sudden somebody goes, you know, what? your shoulders like loose and you just put your hand on it. Like try letting go of that. And you do. And you're like, whoa, wait, hold on. My shoulder was really tight there for a second. And I did. How long has this been this way? I've been with people where they start breathing and they're like, oh. Oh, well, I'm feeling really, really lightheaded. This is what it means to get oxygen. And now they yeah. have that measure of like, and then their next thought is, I wasn't getting oxygen for like a decade of my life. <laughs> and then exactly. Like, Why wasn't I getting oxygen for a decade of my life? And then you have that space to play in of, huh, what else is like, I thought this is just it, but now you change. And it really comes with just holding that amount of space and allowing them to, to feel safe enough. And they're not defined by their autism. Yeah. It's an aspect. It's an aspect of who you are. But everybody knows what it feels like not to breathe for a decade. Most people don't breathe, do they? I mean, I do this work with people who don't have autism and they're like giddy because they actually, you know, their head is, you know, not seized and their stomach isn't seized and then they, yeah, they can breathe again. Um, the but they, the difference is that they know who they are. They, they know who they're coming back to. Mm -hmm. And the thing with people with autism and Asperger's is they, they, they don't have that me. Their me is, is that thing. Yeah. And that's what I think Asperger's is, as much as we might get onto the other fun stuff, you know, because <laughs> I think lots of things. Are yeah, the, the best we thing could go to the the ways thing. we could go with the I gut. Know. We could talk about gut inflammation leading to brain inflammation. We could talk about socials. We could talk about a lot of stuff. But I agree with you. That, in essence, is what Asperger's is. Is just you're so heightened, you're so shut down that then it just sort of, you know, uh, run that out a decade and you get somebody who's really, really scared and traumatized of everything because they literally can't connect to anybody or anything, even yeah. themselves. Yeah. Yes. Even just getting them to connect to themselves is all you need. And this is what, it's the opposite. It is the antithesis of ABA and those other therapies, which all, all they want is you to connect with other people. The, the assumption is that you have the same um, physiology going on. So you, 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 to the best of your ability, you can, but you're a bit crap, but we're just going to, because that's what matters. And it, 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 it's what's wrong in a sense with our, all our old psychology. We, what matters is your connection to yourself. Yeah. Everything is proven better if you just have this gentle self-perception and self-kindness and compassion. And that's what I love about Porges' work the most. It's just... 
uber compassion. It's the most beautiful way of um, perceiving yourself and being kind, which then enables you to be kind to other people. It then enables you to be open. And, um, and you really can't, and you're not in that state. Focused and yada yada, and we go down the line. And if you don't have that, Again, we go back to you assume you have the same physiology, connect with people, no, you just suck at doing it. Let me just teach you. It's it's not <laughs> it's, it's not a they suck at it, it is they like they can't. And they're not stupid. Yeah. It's more like you're pretty stupid, but we'll give you this and you'll scrape through your existence. Yeah. And it's Duns me when I drive away from people's houses and they start to um, have been using words that their parents never thought they knew. And their capacity to um, articulate highly complex emotional situations in the family, um, and they do. And everyone's flabbergasted because yeah. they thought this person was completely stupid. Stupid's the wrong word, but um, very low intellectual capacity. Yeah. Do you, do you know people like Amy Sequenzia? There's different people online now who have really quite full-on um, physical disability um, and don't speak much or and they just type. Yeah. And they're so emotionally intelligent. I love it. It makes me really happy because it it just totally throws that that ridiculous assumption that if you can't talk well and emit, then you have no brain. Yeah. I've heard story after story after story of nonverbals finally getting a type uh, a typing device for the first time and being taught to use it. And then all of a sudden the mom's like, where did you learn these words? And they're like, oh, I've been observing the entire <laughs> time. I've heard everything. Yeah. And then the response is <laughs> either wow or yeah. shit, you know? Yeah. It really makes us have to rethink what consciousness is. You know, in all sorts of ways, what your awareness is, where that sits, because it's much more fun than than our current paradigm, I think. Yeah. It's delicious. Um, and I, I find that time and time again with my clients. they the, the families just don't know what they've got. And it's it's beautiful because then their families are, I don't know, everyone's better off because yeah. this person's available to them. They get to share. Good. And then, I mean, from what I've seen and what I've heard, it's all the people are saying, like, I feel like I got my kid back after he got out of defense mode because, I mean, having been in that state, it feels like you're almost robbed of your humanity in a way. It's like you don't feel fully human. You feel so disconnected. Life is a, literally a terrifying existence and you feel lonely because you cannot physically connect to anything, anyone or yourself. What I also find fascinating is you can do this with people in their adulthood. Like I've got a mum who says, I've got my kid back, but he's 45 and it's gorgeous and it didn't take that long. It's really nice. Yeah. So it's, it's, it, they, there's so much focus on early intervention. That's all. Like if we get them early, we can teach them to tie their shoelaces better. <laughs> but, but it's not like that. You can unlock this body any way along. Really, yeah. and and a lot of it is then how much trauma people have got, you know, yeah. how, what other things have been added to their life. The, I mean, really, the, the big thing is people ask me, well, how long will this take? It's like it depends on how much stuff you have. There, the thing I do people tell people though is don't believe the oh, this is just the way it is, and you're just gonna have, it never ends. It's like no, there is a finite amount. Once you have processed through the finite amount of stuff that you have, then all your job is just to process through stuff in the moment as it happens. Like if you're an uh, example, once I processed through the majority of my stuff, I had to get a cavity filled at the dentist. So I was processing through that as it was happening because, you know, that's, that's a trauma. That's getting, you know, needles stuck in your mouth and all that stuff. And, and that was processing in the moment. Sometimes I have a, a bigger trauma and then it like comes back a week or a month later and then I process through it. But what happens then is once you process through the, uh, the, your stuff, which is generally the longer you've been alive, the more stuff you have generally, that's not always the case, but that's a good general rule of thumb, that once you process through all your stuff, then you just process through things in the moment and you move sort of to real time processing instead of going through the backlog. Yeah, and you've basically got your skill. 
Yeah. Which is how, how to do that processing. Yeah. Um, it, it becomes innate. It's just it's something that you, you know, it takes a while for it to be hardwired, I think. Yeah. You know, it's non-existent. You slowly build it up and, and then there's a capacity and then sometimes people just need the odd touch up when things get a little bit, you know, wonky and they can't kind of hold themselves back down, which is normal for human beings. We're supposed to help each other. We're supposed to. Yeah, that, that's why having a community helps. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So, I mean, really the, what we're talking about for people, they're like, well, how do I do this? It sounds amazing. It's, it's be with that. And like there are articles on our website. You've heard me explain it probably. If you haven't, it's in. Uh, we have a course on be with that and, and deep in defense mode. But you sit with your feelings. You don't try and manipulate them. You don't try and fight them. You allow them to happen and you observe them. That's that's the best way I can describe it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've, I've got some people I work with now and, and I... I've given them tools to use so that it, we do this hand thing or we do my fit ball exercise. So if they can't just sit and do that, they go and do this and get their body into a, a really good state. So they're sort of yeah. all the, fluid all the way up and down. Yeah. And it's lovely because you can have this person who's like, I don't want to do about work. Everything's really full on. And you, you just bring them back into this state where they really know who they are. Yeah. And then you go, now, what, now, now how do you think? And they're like, eh, it's fine. <laughs> and it's you know you really address your your issues differently when you're really in a really good state you can't yeah. think well oh, when your whole system is clenched and banging up to your head a lot of times when people come to me with an issue what it really comes down to is so you're saying that you're uncomfortable and they're like yeah i guess i'm just really scared and then you do the process with them and then you're like hey is that thing still a problem they're like no, not at all. I was just uncomfortable and scared and thought that the, the issue was some external thing. And then once I got yeah. calm and was able to regulate myself, no more issue. Yeah. Because when you're calm and you regulate yourself, your eyes work better. So your perception of the world is completely yeah. different. Yeah. Your ears, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the boogie monster gets smaller. Yeah. I mean, it, it really does. I remember there's a specific moment of my life where my smell turned on and it was weird. I was just walking down the street in downtown Denver and I was going to college there and all of a sudden click, I'm like, oh, I can smell. <laughs> and then the next thought was, I haven't been smelling. And there was another time where I was like, uh, uh, um, I was exercising and my vision went like, and just like, when I, I was just like, huh, this is weird. I'll take it. It's cool. Yeah. And it, it is, yeah, yeah, it literally changes. So it's a lot to adjust to. And it's yeah. not, um, it's swift in some respects. And then it's different things happen over your lifetime, don't they? Because, yeah. you know, you, you weren't expecting that to happen at the gym. Yeah. <laughs> or ex so, you know, so your body, your body, you get used to watching what it will do and, and op how it opens up for you and then how it opens and closes and you're like a little lotus blossom yeah, you know? <laughs> or some such thing. It's really nice. And yeah. then, you, you know, you tend toward the things that, that open you more. So. And you tend to be kind to yourself. Yeah. Which is me vital. It's, it's like you start treating yourself like you're a little lotus blossom. Yeah, and not as a as as an intellectual thing again, but as you 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 you're nice to your body insofar as you can be, and we're all different. We all have different lives, um, but you there's a level of self respect and there's a level of kindness that comes in that I find missing in all of the traditional therapies and and a lot of the discourse around autism. Full stop. It it's sort of you know, when you discuss it as a thing, it's separate. If you dissect it with our yeah. medical way of looking at things, you you cease to view it with kindness, but you cease to view yourself with kindness as well. So it does, it shifts it. It, it shifts it when you just bring it back down to a very basic issue again. Um, you, I don't know, I think that, I think there's a lot of people who have really, hard lives with autism and Asperger's. There's a lot of people that don't like themselves very much. There's a lot of depression. There's a lot of anxiety. There's a lot of other worse things. Um, 
And that, that small thing alone makes a, just this dramatic difference to people's lives, no matter how effective they are then in the community or not. Yeah. But, you know, that doesn't matter as much. It's second. Yeah, because they get effectiveness from connecting with themselves and being kind to themselves. And then it's an inward to outward thing. It's not an outward to inward thing. Yeah, and it's not a goal. I'm not very goal-oriented with yeah. my work. It's that. It, it, that's not an outcome. That's just a, a valid need that every human being has. Emergence rather than a, a, an outcome. Yeah, yeah. Because, I, I mean, I, like when I do my work, I don't actually know what's going to happen to people and what's going to unlock when. Like, you just do the work. And the thing that I, I want to stress here is that in this type of work, we don't actually do the change we just provide a space and a perspective and a context and they and themselves and their body are the ones that actually do the healing or the change or the the transformation or whatever you want to call it it's a really different paradigm isn't it mm -hmm. because it's not top down you're not in charge you're not the therapist you're just actually witnessing and being present and and jigging the environment enough that that there becomes an opening yeah so it's much more um i always really liked the placebo at uni you know because everyone's like oh that's just the placebo and it's like no it's fascinating look what the body can do if you just get out of the way and give it the right conditions and that's pretty well all it is, isn't it? It's actually just, it's about making space. It's a yeah. much less, I, again, I, masculine is our old paradigm of thinking. It's, I think there's a better word than masculine and feminine for these things. But yeah. it's, a, it's a much more um, fluid way of working with people as a model. It's nice. So what do parents do in the times where either they don't live in Australia and can't come find you or they, you know, when, when therapy isn't working, like how, how do parents help support their kids and hold that space for them in the times when for some reason they can't get an awesome person like you to come once a week? When I, I wrote the book because I did a workshop for people because I found out about it all and got really excited and there was no one doing it. So I did a that's, workshop that's so and <laughs> <laughs> the the woman that helped me first get my book ready um, came to my workshop and she was so excited and the thing that stunned me the most was just that information alone transformed their family and it's sort of what we've been talking about where that she could perceive her son differently that she could see what was happening for him as a physiological meltdown rather than he was being difficult um, that how he would struggle in his day at school and their expectations of him in the home all shifted so their entire family life was just better and easier just from that information and it was really cool so in that sense I would say to families you know again take a step back you, you, you shift your expectations it doesn't mean you can't expect things from people with autism because people will get away with murder <laughs> as well you know like you, you have to have boundaries you have to have good expectations but they have to be manageable within the context of that particular human being yeah so, so and i also and I've, I've got it in the book but parents also have a nervous system and they have to look after themselves and they have to know when they're overloaded and they have to take time out get support so that it all the pressure isn't just on them or just on the kid, but actually everyone gets a bit of space around them. And I reckon that's massively important. I, I agree. I mean, just right there, because if all the pressure is on one person, they will inevitably fail at some point because there's too much pressure on them. You need to distribute the pressure. So it's not all on the kid. It's not all on the mom. It's not, you know, it's, it's everybody has an equal weight. And I, th I like that distinction of it's not about having no expectations and boundaries. It's about having the, correct expectations and boundaries that are informed by how the kid is actually you know living in the world as informed by like your book and and our work and things like that um i had one parent come to me once and say yeah just the i changed my intent with my kid 
Like, we literally did not change our actions. We did not change what we said. We did not change what we did. Everything else remained the same. I solely just changed my intent in saying, hey, can you do your homework? I still said, hey, can you do your homework? But I changed my intent. And just through that alone, everything changed. 80% of communication is nonverbal. Yeah. And it's a bit like the placebo. We go, oh, yeah. But it is. You know, like you... Your intent is huge. People know what is coming out of your mouth. It doesn't matter if whether it comes out or not, you know, and people with autism are highly perceptive. With we, that sort of I always say, we know. Yeah. <laughs> so you d it's, you know, half an eyebrow raise. It's, it's, it's energy. It, so you give different energy. And that expectation is, again, you, you start looking after yourself and your energy your kid comes out with something different as well. And, and, and then they don't know what to get out of you. If you're coming from left of field anyway and you're being nice yeah. where you might not, they still have to rethink that, you know, they're, we're, we're all pack animals yeah. in that sense as well. And I think we forget that a bit too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the one last question that I'm sure a lot of people have is uh, how do they get in contact with you in case they want to employ your services? Um, I have a website, so it's www.zebra, Z-E-B-R.co, no A. Um, otherwise, you can just Google Holly Bridges Autism. So I've got a separate Perth therapy page with which outlines my, um, my five-step program. Um, and my phone number's on there and my email, so people can get hold of me oh, cool. pretty easily. Awesome. Yeah, and I do Skype now as well, so um, I'm kind of accessible. So, yeah, for all you non-Australia people, uh, Skype is available. Um, so, yes, thank you so much. This has been awesome. Again, get the book, Reframe Your Thinking Around Autism. It is totally worth it, and um, it will blow your mind. It, it's, it's amazingly beneficial and amazingly useful. Thank you so much for being on here. Thank you so much for doing the work that you do and, and championing the the – small but growing idea that we all sort of share of the polyvagal theory and autism and things like that. So um, you have a great day. Any final thoughts? Uh, no, that was fun. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. So um, um, let me think if I've got a final thought. No, I had lots of other thoughts, so we might have to do another podcast. Oh, ah, yes, we, we might. Okay. Yeah, we, we so, but that'll be for another day. But we're, we're going to call it here because otherwise we'd be here for three hours and nobody you know, would probably listen to that full thing. But, um, y'all, uh, yeah, we'll do this again. Maybe we'll do, like, um, a live one with members of the group where they can ask questions and oh, make yeah. it more interactive and, and fun. So, um, that would be great. Cool. Well, thank you all so much. And talk to you all later. Bye.